Good afternoon and welcome to the weekly discussion of Mr. LaRouche and the National Slate. Joining us via Skype is Keisha Rogers and Dave Christie. And then here in the studio we have Rachel Brown, Bill Roberts, and Lyndon LaRouche, who celebrated with us his 90th birthday over the weekend. And Lynn, you had quite a presidential address yesterday and probably more to add and clarify in that regard. That's probably the case. It's, I thought the occasion warranted that, that, but what's the whole purpose of the thing is to actually present an alternative to these pairs of clowns that we have to deal with now who are on the list. And we're in a period, obviously, contrary to what people may be thinking out there, we're in a period in which one president is evil, Obama, and the other guy seems to be dumb. Not dumb in some matters, but in terms of politically, seems to be un, unaware, shall we say, in certain respects. So neither of these guys is really fit to be president of the United States. But the crucial thing here is it goes beyond that. Not only are they both unfit to be president of the United States, but uh, Obama is actually a menace to humanity. So the, what you've put in a position where you, you almost have to support the crazy uh, Republicans because the Democrats are criminals. And that's not all of them, but those they're supporting are criminal. They're rallying around a criminal and a criminal who can destroy humanity and intends to do so actually is in point of fact. So the point is we, we have to go at the core of the situation, which is what I did and what I needed to do was to point out that there is you know, no sense in continuing the idea of the way we deal with partisan systems now. We've treated, we've often treated, not always, but contrary to Washington, George Washington's intention and some others at later points in the process, we have been against party partisan politics. The idea that there should be partisan party politics is an ab abomination. It, as I said yesterday, or therefore yesterday, it, it causes confusion uh, when you have a, a party politics because people are so concerned about which is going to beat the other that they pay no attention to the interests of the nation. And so they simply get to a, 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 some kind of a crazy golf match or something and they have paid no attention to what the issues of the nation are. The population is therefore stupid, stupefied, because they are induced to increase their intensity of their passion for their choice of candidate and pay no attention to the reality of what the process is. For, you'll have the thing today, well, you know, it's bad, but it's not that bad. Or we, as an excuse for voting for Obama, when Obama is about the worst thing you could possibly have. So they're working for the worst, huh? not worst, but worst. Huh? Oh. And that, that is the issue now, that the United States and civilization in general is in danger of actual extinction because of the conditions that exist out there now. The, first of all, the immediate threat or potential threat now of thermonuclear fu uh, fusion attack. And if that occurs, no human beings. So either vote our way or you will get a true nothing. And that's, that, it, that is a hard thing to present, but it's less hard than the reality that if you go ahead with partisan politics, you won't have a nation. And that's, what, that's what's hitting us now. And that's what we have to put across in a continuing campaign all the way through. We must eliminate that kind of politics and force the people to come to their senses and vote for their real interests as a nation. Go back to what, well, originally George Washington had represented, no partisan politics, no party politics. You're voting for the issues the in, and the interests of a nation. 
and not some side issue. And it's this side issues, it's this partisan politics which has caused the people of the United States to foolishly destroy themselves and bring upon themselves every evil that they've suffered generally since the success of our revolution. Always this partisan politics which degrades people, degrades their mental outlook. And that's what we have to change. And therefore, the, campa the campaign is by no means over. The campaign has really just started. Because the way it's going now, if you leave it alone, is doom. And that's not winning anything. Now you have to break the illusion that this is a party politics issue. The issue before us is an issue of survival. First of all, preventing thermonuclear war, which no one will survive. And the other is the nation as such will not survive. And that's, the, that's what's before us. The campaign has actually just begun. And it will continue as just beginning even beyond Election Day, whatever happens on Election Day. Because the issue will still be there. Is the United States fit morally to survive? Or does it contain people who will mobilize in sufficient intensity and quality to ensure the nation does survive, as it will not survive under the presently po poised suggestion of Obama versus the Republicans? That is a fraud. That is the end of civilization, potentially at least. And therefore, we've got to break it. And it can be broken. But we have to do it. Because they've committed the crime, now they can pay the penalty. And that's the way it has to be approached. Not, what do we do now? What is the alternative? Obama's not an alternative. Right. He's the enemy. And the enemy is not an alternative. The Republicans are fatuous fools. And that's not a very good alternative. <laughs> no. Well, we have a short time now to do it because we have the presidential election coming up. But more importantly than that is the vacuum of any, any idea content. And I have found a reception in the population when you tell them there's no competent leadership anywhere that understands economics. No one understands economics anywhere in politics. Pe people understand that. They agree with it. And that allows you to open up a discussion of what real economics is. I think that that's in the same direction of this partisan question, which, which we do have to push to, to fight with people on the real issues. Um, but but one, one thing also, I think, is that over this summer, although Congress was on recess, it wasn't a political vacuum. It was, it was a political process that was defined by what we were putting out there with the questions of thermonuclear war and economic breakdown. And now we do have Congress coming back into session. Uh, and they're not sure what they're going to do. But I think there is the potential right now to, uh, through what we're saying, to, 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 pu uh, to, to push a, ch a change now in the, in the immediate period ahead. But we have to act on it as that, a change necessary now, not in the election, but defined by the questions of thermonuclear war and economic breakdown. No. What is it? I tried to raise these issues was yesterday, and they will continue to be there. I intended they should continue to be there. That was the whole idea of the operation. <laughs> <laughs> because if we, don't, if we don't launch and continue this alternative, there's no chance for the United States. There's nothing out there to vote for that has the competence to save this nation, on other considerations. There's nothing in Europe right now. There is resistance, but there's nothing that's in the shape of winning. Maybe in shape of surviving, yes, possibly if the conditions are there. And it's Russia, China, and a few other countries, and possibly what we represent, the United States. And that's all there is between us and hell. So that being the case, we cannot afford to flinch. We must do our duty. Yeah, Kennedy, in, in his book, uh, Profiles and Courage, he, may, he makes it very clear how there were specific periods, specific points, events in U.S. history where if it were not for really a handful of individuals intervening 
in a in a nonpartisan way to really act, really in, in a lot of cases sometimes to destroy their own political uh, career. But they saved the country, and and now we're at a point where it's not simply a question of saving the country; it's a question of preventing the extinction of mankind. So the stakes are absolutely much higher. I think, I think the key figure to reference in terms of U.S. presidential and related history is the case of John Quincy Adams. This is a, this is a defining personality following actually George Washington. Uh, of course, the, there's the other, the other case, of, you know, but, the, but this is the John Quincy Adams is a defining case. He organized what became the foundations of the success of the United States. He was the one who shaped and made the United States a nation, a single nation from coast to coast, from Atlantic to Pacific. He really created us as, realized the creation of our, our nation as a nation. And then you had all these bums from London, London career characters, coming in by way of New York City and running the crazy Jefferson camp, uh, business, and then, then also running Jackson, and Jackson more significantly. And President Jackson, who was the, you know, the darling of the Rep Democratic Party, was the most evil influence in the history of our nation. He created what became the Civil War. It was his work. He's just a growling, snarling old bastard. <laughs> but this crew, for, who were London controlled, all of them, British agents, every one of them, control the presidency, and they created the Confederacy. They created the slave system as a system in the United States, as a sectional system. They did it. And it was Lincoln who pulled a miracle, from their standpoint, a miracle of understanding how to deal with the economic crisis that had been created by the launching of the Confederacy. And he, by going to a credit system, he used a credit system and saved the United States by the creation of a credit system. We had a military system then at that time, which was polluted with generals who were not who were generally screwed up, um, who were really softies on the on the earlier Jefferson etc. tradition. And he pulled out a leadership, a military and other leadership, from among his enemies who were not on the Confederate side, but were nonetheless the enemies of, of Lincoln. And he pulled it out. He pulled it out. Grant kept it going. Then we had the return to the qualified version of the Southern Confederacy, which came up then on this crazy debate. Then we were on the road to success, and that president got assassinated too, as others had before. And so, therefore, we know that our enemy is the British Empire. It always has been the British Empire. It is still the British Empire. And the British Empire is not England. It's not the same thing. England is actually under the domination of the British Empire and has been ever since 1763. But nonetheless, you have resistance among people in the British Isles very strong resistance to some degree. And they came back, they led the charge in launching Glass-Steagall as a policy throughout Europe, where it had been previously almost unknown in Europe. And it was discarded, essentially, in the United States and leading politicians. Nobody was, nobody was pushing Glass-Steagall. We were pushing it. And we had enough clout to get some people to, on the basis of reason and so forth, to push it. But they never pushed it effectively. They never intended to actually win. They intended to make a moral posture in favor of some kind of reform. And right now we're in a situation where without, without the Glass-Steagall solution, this nation could not survive. We are on the verge of a general breakdown, a general c collapse of the entire transatlantic financial monetary system. That's about to occur. The push now, between now and the election day, 
is the push to a bailout period, a new round of inflation, hyperinflation actually. This round of hyperinflation, if allowed to continue, will destroy the United States. It finish it off. And that's what we stand. So what we're doing is something on which the continued existence of the United States depends. It's not a matter of who wins the presidency. It's whether or not this nation shall continue to exist. Because if, they, if Obama and company go with a hyperinflationary bailout this time, that will be, break down. It will break down because what will happen, the reverberation between the United States and Europe, both of which are in the process of this breakdown pro process. So a mutual hyperinflationary process unleashed under the Obama administration and in Europe, as from France, that will be sufficient to destroy the ta transatlantic civilization. And therefore, we, you can't say, is it possible to win? The question is, do you wish to survive? We have to win. Because if we don't win, boop, boop, <laughs> goodbye. Well, I think one of the things that comes up with this party question, and it's the same with the single issues question, where people say, like the people we mobilized against Cheney and Bush yep. because of the torture and the war, and now you have Obama who is torturing more people, and he goes beyond torture. Now we're killing thousands of innocent people with drones. He sits once a week and decides who he's assassinating, and people say, well, yes, but he's a Democrat, so I support him. And the Republicans now say, well, he's a Democrat doing this, so I can't support it. But when, another, when a Republican was doing it, I did support it. And you get the same thing where people say, are you for or against abortion? Are you for or against gay marriage? And then whatever your stand is on that, everything else is completely irrelevant. You could be Genghis Khan, but as long as you're for gay marriage, then they'll support you for that. I mean, it, it, people have decided any reason to turn off their mind and think. And I think what you're addressing creates a certain kind of tension where people have to actually be truthful and say, the situation we're pre presented with right now is not acceptable and we have to fight for a solution that allows the survival of the human race. Well, that's the whole point. And you cannot do that by being conventional, because the conventional view is what will destroy you, guaranteed destruction. Well, a lot of this partisanship, you know, you have people who just you get a lot of people who say, "Well, I'm a, I'm, I'm against Obama because I'm a Republican," and you know, I don't. Uh, you, if you guys are a Democrat, I don't want to support you, or they get into this kind of stuff and. Yet these are some of the same people that will rail on the whole European political system when in reality the reason the European political system can be screwed up is because they get sucked into this very same kind of partisan lines. And, and you, you, know, you look at the, what we see in the, the, uh, some of the videos like in the English parliament and whatnot where they, they'll have these kind of fights but they never really get anything done because there's no principle and, and, the, and the way the oligarchy has used the partisan system is to just keep people fighting when uh, in reality the reason our nation was actually set up was it was founded on a principle of self-government which requires the citizens to become fully more citizens to, to engage in the process of self-government which goes above the party system but rather goes to principle and I think if you look at the core of the, of the preamble, when you have the, the question of the general welfare, sovereignty, and posterity of, of preparing for the coming generations, what you actually get at that point is a scientific principle. And you know, we, we've discussed this in terms of what we see in the biosphere and the development of the universe, is it's always to higher orders of, uh, you know, in, in scientific terms, energy flux density. And if we're not prepared as a part of a process of self-government to then create a better future, which is what we're doing with the platform around, you know, Glass-Steagall, National Banking, and NAWAPA, you know, with these kind of projects that actually create 
uh, a better future for, for our people. That that is a scientific principle and that's how we're going to unify the nation beyond the party system of, of simply the uh, gang counter gang operations and people fighting amongst each other but to say what is the scientific principle that enables us as a process of self-government that enables us to govern uh, through a process of self-government. I think that also going back to what what Lynn just said I mean just thinking about George Washington's farewell address this is exactly what he discussed in terms of the the rank and the despotism that existed through the insanity of party systems that it went away and actually rejected this very idea of looking of actually uh, the public liberty uh, increasing the public good and you think about uh, the very key example is what Lynn just brought up uh, what happened with the coup that was run against the nation with uh, the Andrew Jackson Van Buren ki ki uh, the coup uh, that under these factions that were the whole faction of the British Empire that represented a destruction of these types of scientific principles which uh, which John Quincy Adams and which others understood was the foundation for progress in the nation and any great president whether it be uh, John F. Kennedy, John Quincy Adams, Franklin Roosevelt, this is what they actually understood is that a mission orientation toward the future progress of the nation and mankind had to be organized around the standpoint that you know the well-being of the nation came before commitment and allegiance to parties, party oaths, oaths to a presidential candidate as people are uh, doing right now with with Obama you know people had to take an oath of allegiance to Obama going into the Democratic Party National Convention and beforehand not uh, an oath of allegiance to our to our Constitution uh, which the which people should be vowing to uphold you know the case actually though that what was being demanded was what people actually demand they do not People should you strip them of their dignity on this one. They're not voting for the nation. They're voting to support the opinion of some person. Oh. And the opinion they're supporting, the, the stated intention of the person who's giving the, making the policy, proposed policy, is against their interest, fundamental interest, against everything they, they, that is their interest. And they say we have to vote for, to support our interest represented by this figure. And this figure embodies something which is against their interest in every respect. But they have to say party loyalty. I'm for party loyalty. I'm from a Democrat. I don't care what they elect. Huh? That sort of thing. Now, and the whole thing is people are not honest. And the only issue that's going to be decisive in this matter is going to be the threat of thermonuclear war. Because if, if uh, Russia and China and a few other countries don't accept submission, then the British interest, the British monarchy's interest, which is running this show otherwise in the United States, that interest cannot sustain itself under the pressure of the hyperinflation that they are generating as a condition of their policy, or they, even their election campaign policy. So they, they have to destroy, they think, Russia and China and anybody else who gets in the way. Otherwise, they can't enforce their cuts, which would be the most unpopular thing ever, ever occurred. If people knew or were willing to face the fact of what this presidency of Obama represents and what the Republicans are talking about as well is a very similar kind of cuts in the incomes of people. This, if, if actually put forward, would, not, would cause a revolt. But they, even though the evidence is presented that the people of the United States are being robbed and killed, essentially, health care and everything else being killed, they hope they can postpone the revelation of that fact 
long enough to win the next election. The danger is that this whole system of theirs, including the transatlantic system, is in the process of breaking up under hyperinflationary conditions. And this is the strongest in Europe right now because Italy's finished, Greece has been murdered, Spain is finished, and the chain reaction effect of these collapses in Europe mean that the whole system is now on the edge of coming down in September, not November. And that's their problem. And if we don't take the case of that and the case of the thermonuclear war issue and don't use those two aspects, the truth about this ca these campaigns, we lose because people will, can kid themselves as long as certain things don't confront them. But they're going to be confronted with a shortage of food in the United States, which will be intrinsically mass murderous. We, what, is the, what this president is doing incumbently in killing the food supplies on that issue of food supply, he's committing mass murder with his policy. There is no food supply as long as this idea of the substitution of, of food for fuel. If that continues, you're going to have mass death in this country. And it's coming on fast this winter. So you're in a point where the very processes, the evolution of the economic process is such, that that process is presently is, is in conflict with their intention. They cannot pursue this intention out, to, say, toward Christmas time and avoid a blowout. And Europe is on the edge of a blowout. And if Europe goes, the whole shebang goes immediately. And so, therefore, you have to look at the two citizens out there who face, fails to pay attention and say, look, you, Mr. Citizen, you don't have to be stupid, you know. As a matter of fact, your survival depends upon you quitting that little habit. <laughs> And the only way you can get that is on the wet uh, thermonuclear war. It's the only issue which will break through all the excuses which are used to cover up the process. This is headed toward thermonuclear war because China and Russia are not, and other countries are not going to submit. And the submission, the non-submission takes the form of the resistance of Russia directly in the Middle East and also of China. And the Russia and China are not going to accept submission. And Obama and the British monarchy cannot accept non-submission. And the effort to sustain the balance between the two means European hyperinflation pushed in the United States from the president himself in terms of the pushing of another round of hyper bailout. So nothing is settled. Everything is becoming more unsettled, unsettled than ever before, and sooner and quicker. This thing is down. And the issue is not to be distracted and do sec things that people can, don't see through. They don't see something, they, they have an illusion. Well, they're not going to do that, this to us. I voted for this guy. He's not going to do that to me. No. <laughs> but the reality is, is harder. The reality is not public opinion. We call it pubic opinion, not public opinion. And the tension of people is to, to, to believe for a while, the comfort of believing that everything will somehow turn out not so bad. It can't be that bad. That's their slogan. And on, you go through all the issues, the practical issues that define this issue as such, and you find all the ones that they brush aside. Oh, you, they, you, you can't be, that can't be true. You must be exaggerating. That couldn't be true. Huh? That couldn't be true. I know this man. I voted for him. I'm voting for him. Huh? It couldn't be true. What are you telling me? I'm an idiot? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> And that, but that's the point. But what this leads to is that very process is leading to an event which has nothing to do with choices. The only choice you have is the choice to throw out Obama. 
That's the only choice you have. No other choice is voluntary. <laughs> Everything else with a, of a different name is a loser. And that's, it's only on this question of this issue of war, the issue of thermonuclear war, that you can possibly r save the nation at this time. Because it, the threat of thermonuclear war is very, very real. Well, I think that's obviously what some people in the military and in Russia and China do understand on a certain level. And I think it is really important to get it across because, I mean, take the people who didn't stop Hitler with similar arguments, mm -hmm. but Hitler was not in a position to launch a thermonuclear war. So the consequence at that time was tens of millions of people died because people had all of their you had a tiny resistance which was not enough and you had people with all their pragmatic excuses both denial and then people who did impotent things like wrote letters or made statements for the record but did not actually stop him and in this case it's not just a bad thing it really is the end it's like Woodrow Wilson Woodrow Wilson of course was the man who resurrected the Ku Klux Klan on the largest scale it had ever existed. He did that, he did that in, from the White House. It was from the White House himself, itself that he, that he reenacted and restored the Ku Klux Klan. And it was restored on a larger basis than it had ever existed before. Huh? Well, this was not really immoral, I suppose, because that was his family tradition. His family was the, was the real backing of the organization of the Ku Klux Klan originally. <laughs> and so the, here's this guy, and he's the guy who intervened to save Britain in the First World War. If, because if the U.S. troops had not been shipped into France, Britain would have been defeated, and Germany would have been the dominant nation in Europe. And it hung on that few, essentially few weeks, really, of decision making. And then you look at the entire agreement uh, that was made afterward. The whole system, the fraud that was set up. Well, in the peace conference after the so-called peace conference. And they set up the system of Europe that created Adolf Hitler, which was created by the British. And when the British discovered around Winston Churchill that their policy of, of supporting Hitler might have been a mistake, rather than just in a little adventure, you know, a little invent, invention there. At that point, huh, they dealt with Hitler and with the United States. But the British, including the Churchill faction, did everything possible to prolong the war as long as possible. They came up with this Balkan alternative and other things like that. The war should have been over a year, a year and a half earlier. It could have been, except the British were pulling all these side trips and side operations in order to engage the United States to wear Hitler down, huh, but not have an absolute clear victory one way or the other. But on the other hand, but at the same time, to wear down the United States. And what, we, what they did is since our army, our military force, is what it is. It, our force is not a permanent military force as such. You have a cadre organization, not a, not a full-scale military force. And therefore, our troops, who are like me, were draftees and things like that, were, were civilians called into military service. And we reached the level of about 16, 17 million people in, in our, of our population in that category. But when this thing was dragged out, dragged out not only to the extent of the, what, the first phase, which this war should have been over in 1944 at the latest. The breakthrough should have been decisive. It could have been decisive. But the British generals or the German generals were going to force Hitler out huh, in the spring. Right. That, that summer. Right? If that had happened, then the war's over. 
But then the British intervened to inform Hitler and company of the names of the generals who were going to, who had organized this negotiation of peace. That extended that part of the war huh, into the following spring. And the, our troops were becoming worn down psychologically by that time. Then you had the continuation of the Pacific where the Japanese forces had been defeated again and again and again once this process was set into place. Well, we, pro we prolonged it a little bit longer. And we used the thermonuclear weapon, or the nuclear weapon. And the nuclear weapon changed the character of the world at that time. There was no need for using. The, the, the Japan was totally defeated, utterly defeated. There was nothing left in them to fight. A couple of, you know, some Japan soldiers' divisions were still out on the islands ready to carry on fight. But they had, their case was hopeless. And defeat would be imposed very easily, just, you know, just by offering surrender. And that's the way these kinds of things have often happened. That you had a British Empire, which the way the British Empire was established in 1763 is a, is a case in point. Then all the other history of the British Empire, the, and it's like the Roman Empire, it's like the Byzantine Empire, it's like this, the Venetian system, the original Venetian system of the, that led into the Great Dark Age. And it's like the new Venetian system which became known as the British Empire. And we suckers are so wise because we're told by experts in, in the newspapers, for example, that certain things are true, and none of it's true. And it's because we're suckers and choose to believe what the press and other kind of fakers tell us, that we sit back and allow ourselves to be lured into our self-destruction. And that's the most disgusting part. To be conquered is bad. But to be engaged in self-destruction is the worst of all things. And that's what we represent now with these candidates for president. It's not human to support either of them. But it's most unhuman and inhuman, specifically, to support Obama. Because that's the death of humanity. Well, I think, you know, mentioning that we are lured into our own self-destruction. Uh, Russell, when setting up the, uh, he said that we would use the, the fear of nuclear war to impose world government. And that largely what we see now, the reaction of why the British are putting it on there, at least this faction of the British, are putting a thermonuclear war on the table to the Russians and the Chinese is that they didn't accept the world government policy that was to be brought about through environmentalism and monetarism. This is what uh, they've rejected and said, we're not going along with this policy, we're going to develop. There was just this APEC summit where all kinds of development policies were announced and cooperation in the, in the far east of Russia and so on. So, uh, so that's, but you know, one of the things about the environmentalist movement was there was this cynicism about, they said, they said well, if this is where technology leads us, if, if the development of, a, you know, nuclear technologies will eventually lead to these terrible weapons, then let's pull back, or at least that was used as an argument to then enforce the environmentalist movement, which, of course, one of the first elements of it was against nuclear power. So, and now here we are where the, the threat of nuclear war and also the threat of just accept, even if we don't have nuclear war, but if we accept this decadence that we've had since that time of going along with the environmentalism, then we're destroyed as well. So I see it's, it's the reaction to that, which the, the Russians and the Chinese are saying, no, we're going with a development perspective and this is uh, the fight that we have to wage here in the United States as well to, to develop. Put the other thing on the agenda there. Giant rocks <laughs> uh, floating around in space. With last year we had one such rock came streaming through between Earth and the Moon. 
it had not been anticipated beforehand. We're now in a period where it's estimated that because the, where the Earth, the solar system is moving with respect to the galaxy, we're now anticipating the probability of a speeding up of the rate of occurrence and severity of rocks hitting the Earth. Now, the official estimate is that you take areas like San Francisco Bay or areas of that size, and if one of these rocks, the ordinary rocks that come through less infrequently, hits those areas, that whole area is instantly destroyed. But, that, the, the, but the planet might survive still, and that's happened in the past. And we're now into that kind of period. The difference now is we have highly populated regions and areas which are possible targets of this sort of thing. Now the danger of this sort of thing is indicated as increasing. And this has been understood to some degree as, as well as actually since the 1970s when this issue was taken seriously for the first time. If we continue the present program, if we do not build up a space defense, if we do not go beyond curiosity hmm, and realize what we could do, we, we're faced with a situation in which with our estimates, our best estimates now, of our ability to interfere, intervene, to prevent some big rock from hitting Earth in this nature, even not including the big one, the one that takes out the entire human population. But these smaller ones that take out areas like the New York City area or the, or the San Francisco area, things like that, th that is what is likely. And other things come in. But in order to deal with that, we are not prepared to deal with that efficiently. Because right now, we need a number of years of preparation in order to f locate uh, and deal with. In other words, our major effort is you got one point is to try to destroy this rock by splitting it all to pieces or something. But that's not always too good an idea either. But it takes a period of years in order to prepare to divert one of these rocks from Earth as a target of Earth. Therefore, if we now, this year, destroy the ability which we had had and which we still have, as you see in the Mars landing recently, we still have uh, the rudiments of that capability. If we reverse Obama's policy entirely in this direction. Otherwise, we are going to a point where some, that, you know, if we cannot Doing this kind of thing now involves a number of years of preparation. In other words, you just you're going to hit, move something that was going to hit Earth, and you move it a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, over the years, and you get it away from where it's going to hit Earth. With that, we also first of all have to discover that the damn thing exists there, and is coming. We have to locate the identity of these things. We have to mobilize the ability, and we know what the abilities could be to deal with this threat. So if we don't get rid of the Obama presidency and similar kinds of things, and the British Empire's program, the Green program, if we don't get that installed, human being has proclaimed self-extinction as its destiny. And, the, you know, sooner or later, the world's going to have to face that. Uh, some of us are facing it now. Others blind themselves to the fact that that reality exists. And that we are, the big question is, what is the effect of the movement of the solar system into a branch of the galaxy, of the galactic motion, which the human species has never experienced before. That is, the, this, this kind of thing, this thing has never happened. It has happened before. 
but it never happened while the human species was living on Earth. And the question of whether we are capable of defending ourselves against a condition which has never existed for the human species before in the, in the galaxy, but has existed in the galaxy and does exist in the galaxy. And therefore, if we do not realize that the challenge, the leading challenge of, in the future history of mankind is are we prepared to go beyond curiosity because the, way, the best way we can succeed in dealing with this mass of unknown mass but that we don't know where, the, where they all located, they, they can take <coughs> us by surprise. And the only way we can defend ourselves against that is by continuing the implications of the Mars program. Because the, our best shot is to establish a more efficient base on Mars, which can assist us in, the, in, the intervention, in planning the intervention against big rocks and things that are going to hit this planet. And if we don't change the policy immediately, it's going to be too late for us, whatever. So we have a positive mission because we, our intent is to capture these rocks if we can. We can capture these and keep them on the train of the Earth orbit. We want them. Many of them contain valuable minerals. We'll have a mining industry set up there instead of that. And this goes together with the development of the moon occupation. The key to much of this, efficient this, is to actually develop the manned operation on Mars, on the moon. Because this development on the moon is the efficient basis of moving in and out of Earth orbit into these other destinations. Uh, destinations. And what we're working on, is some of our work here is, is already in this direction, is to try to pull together whatever we can get from various sources throughout the world, which is relevant to our, our formulating a, a program of defense of Earth. And the program defense of Earth is actually based on Something was a byproduct of the same operation I was engaged in in the late 1970s, in the SDI. The SDE, as promoted by some Russians recently, is the same thing as the SDI. The SDI is the prototype on which the SDE is based. And that gives you a good indication of why I'm so firm on this process, because of the SDI. I was one of the chief promoters of the SDI. Well, yes, there were big forces, major important people came out in on this program but at the time it was presented to President Reagan. But I was, I was the guy who created it. And I've got to step back again right now and tell the stupid jerks to get out of the way. We have a job to do. And I think this is the very reason we have to dump Obama in his policy of mass extinction now and destroy this notion of populist party politics because, as you're saying, unless people are thinking about uh, the direction of mankind from the standpoint of a man's uh, role in space, man's role in the universe, then they're not actually thinking in the right direction. And just to add on this question of how we've been blindsided by the threat of mass extinction through these asteroids. Just look at what's just happened with these budget cuts as of August of this year. Now every aspect uh, with the cuts to the Sliding Springs Observatory in Australia, every aspect of any asteroids that would be hitting the planet, uh, the satellites that would observe that, uh, below 30 degrees south latitude are are being have been destroyed. You will not be able to see that. We've actually blindsided man's ability to be able to pre protect itself from the threat of asteroids and these big rocks rocks that we're speaking of. And so this is what's not being debated or not being discussed in populist party politics that the threat of th the threat of mass extinction is very present uh, to right now. Yeah, it is. Absolutely true. We're, is, is it a time schedule? Yes. But it, it, since it takes time to put in place defenses, 
and you have to develop them in a large degree, that you know, a generation or two generations ahead can be, cru can be crucial for mankind. And the sooner we get at this, and the faster we think about these matters, the more likely we can save the human, spe the human species from extinction. I think that's definitely a worthwhile mission. I think we should commit ourselves to not sliding into self-destruction. I think that's a commendable idea. <laughs> <laughs> so I think with that, we'll wrap it up for this week. And hopefully, we'll be here to see each other and you again next week. <laughs>